I'm really excited to be here to talk to you today about, uh, about how bees make their nests. And this will be a survey of lots of the diversity in the world of bees. So you're gonna learn lots of things about different ways that bees make a living. I'll start by just talking a little bit about Xerxes. Oop, slide advance. One second. Oh, there we go. It's a click. Uh, okay, so uh, sir, all three of us work for the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation, and we just briefly want to introduce you to the organization. As you probably know, we protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. We do lots of habitat restoration work, as well as education and outreach. And um, if you're curious about where we got the name Xerxes, it's the name of the first butterfly that we know went extinct due to human activities uh, in North America. So um, there's a picture of it on this slide. That's our, our namesake. Um, we protect wildlife um, through managing habitats and uh, protecting the invertebrates themselves. We do this with um, lots of groups of uh, stakeholders like landowners, as well as uh, partners in academia and government and uh, land managers of all sorts. Um, and we're a nonprofit, so we depend on donations large and small. And um, so we invite you to spread the word about this as well as donate, become a member if you are interested in doing so. You can find out more at that link, sourceuse.org slash donate. So here's an outline of what we'll be talking about for the next uh, 45 to 50 minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll first uh, talk about the basics and overview of bee nesting, and I'll, pres I'll present that. Um, then we're going to talk about the nesting biology of some of the major or common bee groups or uh, genera, so groups and genuses, <laughs> um, around uh, with a focus on uh, the United States and on North America, but we'll, we'll be talking about bees that occur on other continents as well. Um, and Sarah and I will both be talking about bees there, and then we will split the third section, action steps, about how we can, um, we can promote bee nesting in the lands that we manage, whether it's just your front yard or you're a farmer, uh, or you manage lands in some other capacity. So let's get started. Um, so uh, first, unfortunately, we need to talk about the, the fact that many invertebrates are in decline. So uh, some are doing okay, but we know there's a consistent signal in the invertebrate world of, uh, of, of declines in abundance and diversity. And we see just a, a plethora of these uh, peer-reviewed articles that have come out in the last five years or so uh, documenting declines in the biomass of insects or the species richness in some cases, that would be a way of saying diversity. Um, and there is some uncertainty about just how bad the problem is, but we at Xerxes like to say um, that um, that is uncertainty that we can live with and we're just, we're confident that there are declines and we know enough now to act um, on behalf of these invertebrates. And so that's part of why we are here today talking to you about the fascinating life of bees in their nests. Um, some of these bees are imperiled by um, human activities and, and we just think that um, it's important to raise awareness of how the bees live. Um, so why are they imperiled? What are these threats from coming from people or from other, other um, um, aspects of the life histories of the animals? Well, these are the, the this, is, this is an image from um, a peer reviewed publication that we both like. Um, and it, it illustrates many of the major stressors to invertebrates generally. And in blue boxes, we've highlighted the major ones for pollinators, especially bees. So that would be habitat loss. And, and I would encourage you to think not only of the loss of flowering habitat, but also of nesting habitat. So as we go through this talk, think about those, what is the substrate that we're talking about that bees are nesting on or in and, and why are we losing those things? Um, invasive species are a problem for bees. Uh, the honeybee is actually a, a real problem as an invasive animal for the native bees that live here. Uh, climate change is a serious problem. Uh, we know that pathogens and parasites have caused declines of some species. And of course, pesticide exposure, whether in the context of agriculture or elsewhere, is a serious threat to invertebrates. How many bees do we have around the world? Just how big is the, the assemblage of organisms we're sitting here talking about today? Well, there are more than 20,000 bee species that have been described around the world, and we know that there are going to be more. Um, taxonomists continue to work, and so we might get to 21,000, something like that. In North America, we say that there are approximately 5,200 species, and in the US and Canada alone, um, 3,600 species. So this is a, a lot of diversity. Um, and if you just compare to other organisms you may be familiar with, birds or mammals or plants, 
Um, this is some stunning diversity and um, while not as high as maybe other invertebrate groups like beetles, um, we're going to see lots of diversity in the way these bees make their living. So let's talk about that. How do they live? Well, there are four main lifestyles of bees, of all 20,000 bees. Uh, the vast majority are solitary, and that means that the female bee, after mating, is going to do everything else to nest. She's going to construct the nest or find the nest area. She's going to provision it with resources, lay an egg, close it up, and leave. Um, that's in contrast to the way social bees live, and I'm sure you're familiar with honeybees and probably bumblebees and the way that they are social. And so something like 10% of our bees are social. They live, live in family groups uh, of a mother and her descendants, usually her, her non-reproductive daughters and then later her reproductive sons and daughters. Um, there are many bees that are actually parasites of other bees. Some 15% of all bees are parasites of other bees. And we call those brood parasites usually where they, they sneak into the nests of other bees, usually solitary bees and lay an egg. Um, and then we have a small number, less than 1% are social parasites. They interact with social bees and take over their colonies um, and force those colonies to, to share in the reproduction. So um, what we're really here to talk about is not those life histories, but where do they take place, right? How do, where do they nest? And so here is the breakout on those statistics for the same bees. The majority are ground nesters. So they're going to be nesting underground in the dirt. Um, and that's about 75% of our species. Uh, almost all of the others are wood nesters. They nest in twigs, in um, cavities that are dug by beetles or other organisms. Um, sometimes they dig their own cavities, but it's usually it's wood above ground. And then we have a very small percentage that are that, that are cavity nesters, and they require a pre-existing cavity. And that would include bumblebees and honeybees in that little light blue segment at the bottom there that represents about 1% of all of them. Um, so before moving further, we wanted to present to you just a basic life cycle for a solitary bee. This is going to be true for one type of bee, but not for others. But we want you to see generally what is going on, whether they're nesting below ground in the dirt or above ground in a stick or in some cavity. This is the life of a solitary bee, more or less. So in spring, females will emerge from the nest, uh, find male mates um, and mates, and then forage for food. Uh, they will excavate a uh, nest cell, which you see on the right side of the image there, that photo that has some bright orange powder in it. That is the pollen that the female has provisioned the nest cell with. And the nest cell is cut away, so you can see into the ground where this bee has dug a chamber to um, provision and then to lay her egg on top of. So as we go around clockwise, you can see at the bottom, you see the the little egg on top of, uh, of the pollen mass. And then the next picture over clockwise is the larva itself. Um, eventually we go to a pupa, which is the picture on the far left. And then uh, that turns into the adult bee. Most bees have just one cycle per year, they're univoltine. Um, so think about this, this annual cycle where they may have just a few weeks of activity where they're above ground, foraging, mating, uh, digging nests, um, sometimes it's as little as three weeks. Uh, some of them it's months, as you'll hear, but just keep this in mind that it's an annual cycle where uh, reproduction is occurring during the, the usually the warmer or wetter months of the year. So I'm now going to pass it over to Sarah to start talking to us about the nesting biology of some specific groups of bees. So take it away, Sarah, and I'll do my best to advance the slides on time. Okay, thank you so much, Leif, and hi, and welcome, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to pick up right where Leaf, where Leaf stopped with this idea that we have three major groups of native bees based on nesting habitat, and I will be focusing in to start with with the, this middle category, the, the stem and wood nesting bees. So these are the bees that use the hollow or pithy plant stems and branches, typically dead plant stems or branches um, in our yards if we manage our flower gardens to promote them and in other places as well. Um, these are also the bees that will use empty tunnels and stems, uh, sorry, in stumps and in snags and dead trees, dead wood left by boring beetles and other insects that bore into wood. So the, the, the take home message here is that boring beetles leads to interesting bees. Um, and these are also the, the types of bees that will use a lot of our artificial nesting substrates. So things like the bee blocks and stem bundles and bee hotels that, that folks put up. Um, 
there are quite a few genera that use this type of resource. Um, we chose six to talk through here in this talk today, thinking about you know, trying to represent a, a broad range of nesting biology uh, nationwide, and also thinking about some of the bees that we think you might have the most likelihood of encountering and, and being able to do something meaningful to support in your own landscape. Uh, so I'll talk through each of these in more detail, but looking at them all together, you can see one thing that they have in common is that they're all able to create a nest in a linear space, like a, a tunnel in wood or a stem. Um, but they do vary probably most notably in the types of materials that they use to partition those, those nest cells with. Um, some use leaves, some use mud, and I'll, I'll talk in more detail about each of these as we go forward. Okay, so I am starting with the small carpenter bees. This is probably my favorite genus of bees. Um, mostly I think because they're so readily observable. Um, it, it, you can manage stems in your yard and really get an awesome chance to see bees actively provisioning, overwintering, um, nest guarding, all of these neat things. So in this group, the females excavate nests, which is a bit unusual. So they, they use their mandibles to dig out nests in pithy stems. And that's why they're called carpenter bees. Um, the cells are in a linear series. So the nest is rather simple. Um, the cells themselves. So I kind of think of the, the cells as individual bedrooms for each offspring. Um, and those cells are partitioned with pith that they create or kind of sawdust type material that they create as they're digging. Um, for us, the nest sites can be recognized um, by, if you're looking at a plant stem or a branch that's, that's broken, you can see it, sometimes see evidence of chewing or smoothing around the entrance. And I think you can kind of see it in this middle photo here. Um, or sometimes it's just a perfect circle dug into pith. The nest entrances are not capped or plugged. So this is pretty unusual in, in our solitary bees. And it, it also seems pretty dangerous. Um, there's a lot of natural enemies out there that are interested in the larvae and, and in these nests. Um, but it works out for serotina bees because the female actually sticks around and guards the nest um, and fends off potential um, parasitoids and parasites. And um, she also does a lot of other interesting things as she's hanging out. Um, I think of them as really good mothers. Um, she, will, she will dip into the nest and, and check on her brood, um, sometimes move feces around, um, move if anyone dies in there, move them around to, um, to prevent the spread of disease. Um, uh, all of this is, is interesting to me, partly because it helps us understand the evolution of sociality in bees. So these are kind of thought of as solitary bees, but they exhibit a lot of subsocial behavior. So things like the maternal nest guarding I was talking about, there's also an example of biparental care where we have males also involved in some of that guarding. Um, in some occasions, the, the mothers will stick around long enough for her offspring to actually emerge as adults and give them food. Um, and yeah, lots, lots more I could say about that. But moving on, um, this, this group, not only do they nest in stems, but they also will overwinter in stems. So that's another opportunity for us to see them. Um, in the spring, you might see a large group or, or sometimes just one or two overwintering in a, in a broken or cut stem. Um, again, really a fun genus for observing nesting, provisioning, overwintering. Uh, the Megachylae are another group with really fascinating nesting biology. These are solitary bees. The females nest in stems, tunnels, and wood, rock cavities. Some excavate their own nests underground or use uh, abandoned nests from other animals or insects underground. They are. Um, share the common theme of cutting leaves, sometimes flower petals, and they use these leaves to partition cells and plug up their nests. So I've got a lot of photos here and I'll talk you through them. Um, on the left, you can see a female with, she's got these strong scissors-like mandibles that she uses to cut leaves. So you might see this at a leaf. Um, she cuts the leaf 
flies home with it, as you can see in the second photo, um, brings it into the nest where she arranges it to create these capsules or kind of like sleeping bags. Um, and each of those capsules gets stuffed with pollen and nectar. So that's food for that baby and an egg is laid and then it's sealed off. Um, and you can see this can happen underground or it can happen in a stem like this linear series on the bottom. And one of the things that's really fun, it's been fun for me personally when observing these bees is how, um, well, how common it is to see the leaf cuts if you're watching for it and how interesting their preferences are. So in my area, these are all photos I took last summer in the northern Minnesota area. And there's certain plants that they just love. Like they'll consistently look like Swiss cheese when I'm out in the woods. And then there's so many plants that they, they don't even consider using. Um, if you stick around to the end of this, we'll talk through some of the plants that seem to be most important for leaf cutter bees. But here, I also wanted to point out that, um, well, one way that you can tell the leaf cutter cuts from other types of, of herbivory, like caterpillar herbivory, is how perfect these cuts are. And they tend to be either circular or oval. The oval cuts are used to um, kind of wrap that capsule around. Um, and then the circular cuts are used to on the ends of the capsule and then also used to seal off the entire nest entrance. As you can see here, this is a nice circle and she's using it to seal off the nest. Okay, moving on to another closely related genus, the Osmia. Um, these are really economically important bees. A lot of them are super important in pollination of many of our tree fruit crops and our small berries. Um, also, we're managing, we're able to manage some species, so we know quite a bit about their nesting biology. Females generally nest in empty insect burrows in wood or in hollow stems, or um, they can be opportunistic and build nests in other narrow protected spaces. You might find them between two, two boards or cracks in rocks. The nest configuration is varied, um, but often linear if it's in a linear space. And in general, they use mud to partition their, their cells and also for capping the nest. So this is just a great little inside the nest view where you can see the individual bedrooms and then also the pollen and nectar provisions and the, the egg developing into a larva on, the, on those provisions. Um, moving on to another group, the Hiriades or resin bees. Um, again, these bees nest in hollow stems and pre-existing tunnels and wood. Um, also, they are known to use galls and pine cones. These are smaller bees. Um, the nest cells are typically in a linear series. And in this case, they use resin for partitioning cells and also for capping the nest. This log over here was one that we found on a, a farm where I was working and there were Hiriades provisioning and, and, and capping. I should also note that there are other, there are wasps that cap with resin. So if you see resin capping a, an opening in a log or something, you don't necessarily know that it's a, it's a resin bee, it could be a wasp. Same goes for if you see mud on, a, on an entrance, a nest entrance, you don't necessarily know it's an osmia. Um, it could be a number of wasps that also use mud. Um, here you get a look inside of the nest. You can see the, the resin as the partitions. Another group of small mason bees, these nest in pithy stems, insect burrows, and dead wood. Um, in this case, the cells are partitioned with chewed or masticated leaves, um, and also often with pebbles and soil particles and dead wood. Um, so they're well known for just these fantastic nest architectures, and then also a lot of them are specialists on certain groups of plants like the Fabaceae and the, the Borage family. Um, the, so the cells are partitioned with these varied materials. The nest is also capped with these same materials, as you can see in this series of four photos, the little pebbles and shoot up leaves. Um, you can see them at, at leaves the same way you can see megachylia at leaves, and they'll be gathering up leaf tissue and carrying it home in their mandibles. 
Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're building kind of a fortress here. And, yeah. and I just wanted to point out that there's a lot to guard against. So just one um, paper looking at one type of hoplitis B found numerous parasites and predators of that nest, um, ranging from cuckoo bees, wasps, blister beetles, clarid beetles. Um, so, and this is, this is not unique to hoplitis. All of these native bees, when they build their nest, have to be thinking about who else might be interested in, in getting in that nest and, and how to protect against that. Um, okay, so the, the Hylaeus, these are yellow-faced bees. And I think this is the first bee, no, the second bee I've talked about that's not a, a, in the Megachylidae family. So these are actually more closely related to the Caledids. Um, and they are, um, but they've got this similar, similar nesting biology. They nest in hollow stems. They're quite small bees. So the stems that they choose to nest in are also quite small. Their nest configuration is linear. Um, and in this case, we've got cellophane secretions from the mandibles of the female that's used for partitioning the cells and also for capping the nest entrance. And it really, I mean, it really has the appear appearance of, of cellophane um, and also um, has uh, some properties of being very water resistant. So a lot of these bees are associated with wetlands and there's some evidence that at least some of these nests are able to tolerate being submerged in water and still result in, you know, successfully emerging adult bees. And here's a little look inside the nest. And yeah, I think that's all I have on those. And I will turn it over to Leaf to talk through some of our ground nesting bees at the genus level. All right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, yeah, so I'll talk about some of these ground nesting bees, and obviously they're not in stems above ground, but you will see lots of parallels to the bees that you just learned about from Sarah. Um, so in the case of these ground nesting bees, uh, probably the majority of them are solitary, so single females that have mated who are excavating and provisioning and egg laying, um, but there are some social species that we'll talk about. Uh, the, these, these tunnels that they excavate, they're actually moving all of the dirt outside, uh, um, just like ants do. Um, so they have adaptations for doing so. They can be shallow, maybe just a centimeter, but some are very, very long, as we'll learn as we go through this. Um, the eggs are usually laid singly on a pollen mass, as you can see in the photo on the left side. So that little grain of rice is a bee egg. And the, the female, the mother, is done with that, that cell. Everything now is up to the environment and the the offspring. So the, 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 the egg will hatch, the larva will go about its business, um, it will never meet its mom, it will never get care from another bee. Um, so that's, that's how solitary bees do their thing. Um, it's important to say here that these bees that nest in the soil are exposed to pesticides through soil contact. Um, it's pretty obvious uh, if they're handling dirt with their mandibles, with their mouth parts, they're, they're going to uh, come in contact with pesticide residues in soils that are treated, right? But um, EPA does not regulate pesticides with respect to whether bees ex are exposed to pesticides in soil. And um, in fact, most of our, uh, the majority of our bees are uh, con contacting soil at one point or another. So it's really important that we start to think about, in, at least in agricultural context, the, the, um, the contact with soil and what that means for bees. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about six different types of ground nesting bees from different parts of the family tree of bees. Uh, they're not all closest relatives or anything like that. Um, the common names here on the right in this table are mining bees, digger bees, chimney bees, furrow bees, squash bees, and fairy bees. And I've got a photo of each of them here, as well as the genus names. And I'll, I've got one slide for each of these, and I'll go somewhat quickly through this. Obviously, the commonality is that they all nest below ground, having dug into the dirt but pay attention to what's different about, about their lifestyles in that same basic architecture. Uh, so Andrina is the genus name for the mining bees. Most of these, maybe all of these are solitary species. So a female excavating and provisioning and egg laying in a nest, um, but they actually have some, um, some behaviors that could over evolutionary time scales lead to more cooperative behavior and maybe sociality. So for example, sometimes in some species, females will share a nest entrance, which they, one of them digs, or maybe they both dig. 
Uh, and then they'll have bifurcating tunnels to different, different homes that are separate and there's no communication or collaboration in the rearing of those offspring. Um, many of these guys are pollen specialists, uh, a wide variety of plant families, but I've highlighted the two most common ones, the willow and uh, sunflower or aster plant uh, families. And I've included a drawing of what a, one of the nests here. And you'll see this for each of these six groups of bees. And that, so at the top, you can see the soil surface and a little bump there, which we call a tumulus, this little uh, raised area that the bee makes sort of like an anthill. Um, and then the tunnels usually proceed vertically or semi-vertically downward. Some of them are, are heavily branching as in this case. And then they all terminate in these little cells or bedrooms uh, that have a pollen mass and an egg laid on top of it, later a larva and finally a pupa in there. Um, and, and in some of these diagrams, you'll just see that the bees successively close them off and then start excavating new ones. Now we'll move on to Anthophora or Anthophora, the digger bees. I like the genus name here. Uh, the Latin, as far as I understand it, means flower lover, which is a good, uh, a good description of virtually any bee, but um, this one, this one uh, is a good example of that. So these are solitary species that, um, that may also share nest entrances similar to the Andrina. Um, they like to nest in large aggregations. Um, Andrina also does this. Um, this is a this is a bee you is very obvious when it's nesting in aggregations because it's large bodied and there are hundreds of holes. Um, the the substrate is vertical. Uh, sorry, is horizontal clays and muds, but they also nest on vertical faces of clay banks and things like this. These photos come from a colleague who built a side of his house out of adobe mud blocks to encourage this very bee to nest in it. And, um, and so we see that the bee is, is happily making nests in the side of, of our colleague Sam's house. Um, some of these guys, uh, they, they tend to produce these distinctive turrets, these, these tunnels that, it, that come from the hole outwards. And we don't know why they do this, but it's possibly a defense against, against natural enemies like parasitoid wasps or flies. Uh, some of them are generalists, some of them specialize in certain plants, for example, in the sunflower family and the pea or fabaceae family. Um, the difference in this image, this, this drawing of the nest here, I see is one long tunnel and then uh, the cells right near the end of the tunnel, as distinct from the one you saw with Andrina. I'd like to talk about these chimney bees. Uh, the genus name is Diadasia. These are found mostly in Western North America and in South America outside of the tropics. They are solitary bees that nest in giant aggregations. So all of these females nesting right next to each other, they must be communicating to some degree, but they are not cooperating to, to uh, improve their chances of producing offspring. They just happen to live near each other. And we speculate that it's, it's a defense against predators and parasites, you know, many eyes. There are many different bees there to look out for these, these, uh, these natural enemies, but also your chance of being attacked is lower if there are hundreds of other uh, potential victims. I, that's, that's the reason that we tend to use. Um, this is a bee that will carry nectar back to the nest and then regurgitate it and make a muddy, um, a muddy mix as part of the architecture for their nests. Um, some other bees will carry water instead uh, to, uh, to excavate uh, the mud or other, or other substrates that they nest in. This is another one with both generalists and specialists, but some really amazing specialist bees that only use, for example, certain plants in the mallow family, as this bee is doing on the um, right-hand side, um, and many other plant families, including cacti. So in the Western US, if you go looking at cactus, you can often find a diadasia female. Um, and here's that drawing superimposed over a photo of the same nest from the same study, just so you get a sense of what the nests look like when we excavate them carefully. I should pause here and say, there are two ways that we know what the architecture is like for soil nesting bees. One is when we carefully excavate um, downwards into the earth like this researcher did and, and revealed the tunnel. The other is actually, we, it destroys the bee nest, but we will pour plaster of Paris into the nest and let it harden. And then you carefully dig that out and you have this, this structure that's the negative space of the, of the nest. Moving on to Halictus, the furrow bees or sometimes known as sweat bees because they have a tendency to land on your, your body when you're, when you're sweating and, and lap up those minerals. These are found around the world. Uh, they're very diverse in how they live, but they're, they're um, nesters in the ground in tunnels that they excavate. Some of them are solitary, some of them are social, and some of them in the same species, we see a variety of 
life histories that go on depending on the environmental context they live in. So I've got one example in the notes here, Helictus ligatus, in some parts of its range, it is poorly social to almost not social, uh, subsocial, we should say. And then in other areas, it is eusocial. It is a highly developed social structure with caste differentiation and just like a similar to a, a bumblebee or honeybee. Um, so that's, that's an interesting variation that leads to differences in nest architecture. So for social species of this genus, they, they, the nest must last much longer. And so I've got a diagram here from a social species. Over four months, this person um, estimated what nests would look like. And the point of this image is to show you that nest architecture changes over the course of time. Sort of obvious, but when you think about it, it's an important part of this whole story that the bees are continually excavating, uh, reforming their tunnels and the cells at the end of them and producing new cells for new offspring. Um, Helictus is a generalist pollen forager. Um, two more quickly, uh, Pepanapis or the squash bees. These are solitary bees that nest in communal aggregations in soil on farms right next to flowering cucurbits. So that would be squash and pumpkins. A few uh, native plants occur in the same genus, cucurbita. Um, but these, these bees are entirely dependent on this plant for pollen. So that you will only find them uh, around uh, farms in most places, and then sometimes around these wild plants. Um, it's fascinating stuff that I don't have time to get into, but this bee uh, followed indigenous people across the continent as they moved squash north and east. And there are some studies that have documented how this happened based on genetics. Um, so this bee has a, a history that's tightly tied to ours. Um, and um, it is still a very important pollinator of cucurbit crops around the continent. And um, this is one of those bees that is impacted by pesticide residues in the soil. Obviously, uh, lots of pesticides are dumped on, this, on cucurbits. And these bees suffer the consequences. Um, they're also they're also impacted by tillage. So there are some recommendations for farmers about how to avoid damage to these nests when they till the soil. Finally, we'll talk about Pertida, the fairy bees. This is a wildly diverse lineage of very tiny bees found almost entirely in the western part of North America. Um, they are solitary. They nest in these below ground burrows that they excavate. They can be long and meandering underground. There's some fascinating natural history. Um, I've got two quick examples for you. One is that these bees live in arid areas and when it's too dry, when there's an ongoing drought, research has shown that they can stay underground for multiple years. Just like a, a desert annual wildflower seed might spend three years waiting for the rains, these bees do the same thing. They're underground, alive, slowly metabolizing stored resources and monitoring soil moisture. Um, there's one study that suggests they could live as much as 10 years before they finally come out again. So the other um, anecdote I have here is that some of them nest in muddy soil around seasonal pools. And there's one study from Florida showing that they spend almost half of their time underground, under um, inundated areas. So um, there's water above them and um, they're probably subsisting on oxygen from, uh, from uh, algae that grows in those pools. So pretty cool biology and um, long uh, evolutionary histories there, I would, I would guess. All of these bees are specialists on plants like this euphorbia flower and many other plant families, especially the asters. I will now switch to speaking about cavity bees and we'll quickly go through cavity bees and then I'm gonna turn it back to Sarah. Um, and so these are those bees that cannot excavate their, the hole that they live in. They need to find a pre-existing cavity. And that tends to include social species and some of the most uh, well-known bees. So for example, honeybees need a cavity in nature. Uh, bumblebees need a cavity. Uh, at the center photo here is a birdhouse being occupied by a bumblebee colony. Uh, and then we also see these, these stingless bees in the tropics. Uh, on the left, this is an Australian species uh, bee that is using um, wax from the bees' bodies to make the, the cells to store resources and to store the larva. Um, on the far right, we see a New World tropical stingless bee using resin gathered from plants to make the entrance, the cylindrical entrance to the nest, which is a preformed cavity. Um, so we see that uh, although these bees cannot dig their own cavities, they remodel the interior, either with secretions from their own bodies or things that they forage in the environment. And I'm going to move to just talking about bombus, the bumblebees, for um, a, a quick bit here as an example. These are the bees that I work on and the ones I know most about. So 
Um, these guys are somewhat flexible in the cavity that they choose. They must have a pre-existing cavity, but they are somewhat flexible in which one they can use. The most important, most valuable cavity that they use is a rodent burrow, but they will also use uh, all sorts of other cavities um, like uh, the scree slope in the central photo, um, things from the human built environment like this beer can. Um, at least they take a look at that hole and think this could be a good place to, to nest. Um, we see them nesting in old furniture left in sheds. We see them nesting in wood piles, in rock walls, all sorts of sort of inf <laughs> informal uh, cavity producing structures that people have a hand in. Um, and so what's going on inside the nest for these cavity nesting bees? Well, there's a lot of diversity in the behavior and the ecology of, of the various cavity nesters I've introduced. I'll just talk about bumblebees here. Um, one thing is they nest, they carefully manage the interior conditions of the nest. So unlike those solitary bees where um, if it gets cold outside, it's cold inside. <laughs> these guys are maintaining a steady temperature about 30 degrees centigrade, whether it's colder or warmer outside, the, the nest will always be about that temperature. They monitor humidity and carbon dioxide as well. They can cool the nest by flapping their wings, which they do at the tunnel, the entrance to the, to the cavity. They can heat the nest by shivering and generating heat because they're warm-blooded um, insects. Uh, the photo at the bottom center is an infrared camera image from a lab study by a colleague, just showing um, that the bee herself, this queen, is hot and she has just jumped off of the brood that she was incubating, also hot, just a little bit less hot than her body. And the surrounding ambient air is much cooler. So you see that these bees actually incubate just like birds and pass heat to their offspring to speed their development. Um, there's also progressive care, progressive feeding of those, the brood, the larva. So the, these bees are constantly feeding, um, literally passing food right into the mouth of the, of the larva. They move the larva to different places when they get larger. Um, so there is a lot going on inside of a bumblebee nest. And finally, they defend the nest against enemies. And I've got one of the enemies on the top Second photo from the right, that is a, a bumblebee, but it's a, a it's a parasitic or socially parasitic bumblebee species that attacks these other bumblebee species, forcing those colonies to rear its own offspring. Um, we can talk more about that uh, if people are interested after the slides. And so now I'm going to uh, pass it over to Sarah to talk about what we can do to improve uh, bumblebee, uh, sorry, bee nesting substrates habitats in our own landscapes. Great, thank you, Leif. So I'm I'm going to kick off this section by introducing you to a Xerces resource that goes into quite a bit of detail on a number of nesting features that are important for bees and that can be readily incorporated into most landscapes. And what we are getting at here is that there's there's a lot of interest and enthusiasm in planting flowers. Um, flowers are really showy and attractive and fun. Um, and there's a lot of great guidance out there on what flowers are most important for which bees, um, but not a lot of guidance available for nesting, um, even though it's pretty clear that our mainstream landscaping and farming practices really aren't leaving enough um, natural resources to support pollinators through this, you know, their entire life stage, the, that whole life cycle that Leaf has been talking about. So we will, um, talk you through some of these features. And I and I, I guess I wanna start by just explaining that we decided in, in that guide and also in our, in our presentation today to really focus on natural nesting habitat as opposed to artificial nesting habitat like the, the bee boxes and the stem bundles. And there's some reasons for that. So I'll talk you through this. Um, a few of the challenges with the artificial nesting habitat is that they can harbor disease they often require sanitation and careful ma maintenance. Um, also, these, these um, configurations where we have a lot of nest entrances in one close space is a pretty simplified environment, which makes it easier for parasites to usurp nests. I've seen wasps go through a bee block and dip their ovipositor into every single hole very efficiently. I've also seen Woodpeckers um, rip bee boxes to shreds, knowing there's a lot of larvae in there that they can take advantage of. Um, also, sometimes these artificial nesting habitats have limited success. This is especially true in the case of the artificial um, bumblebee nests. Um, 
all that said, they can be a great educational tool and a really fun way to introduce folks to the fact that, you know, we're surrounded by all these bees and they're, they're nesting in these unique places and we can kind of watch them provision and, and do their thing. Um, in contrast, our natural nesting habitat features are very low maintenance. Um, they also tend to be more complex systems that support a higher diversity of organisms. They can also be a great educational tool. And I think in my experience, um, the, the holes in wood and, and also stems, if managed appropriately, can be a pretty easy way to take people out and, and show them, yeah, this is, I bet if we open this up, we'll find a serotonin in here. And you know, you really do if you know what you're looking for. Um, the thing I'm most excited for with, with regard to this natural nesting habitat approach is how multifunctional it is. So these different features really provide a variety of ecosystem services. And this next example shows how just a single plant, this is cup plant, um, can be managed for stem nesting, as you see with the stem stubble, but it's also providing water and pollen and nectar and seeds for a variety of wildlife. Okay, so we'll talk you through some of these actions. Um, the first being save the stems or create stem stubble. Um, and the process for this is to leave your native flower stalks intact over the winter. So leave them standing there, the seed heads and everything, that's food for birds. In the spring, prune them to create nest sites. And I try to do this in my own landscape when, you know, right before I know bees are gonna be starting to emerge and looking for a potential place to live. Cut at a variety of heights, um, approximately eight to 24 inches. The variety of heights helps um, create stems, stem entrances of different diameters, which accommodates a wider variety of bees. And then that's, that's really it. You can watch for activity and see what plants seem to be most attractive, um, but you don't ever have to do any cleanup of that stem stubble. Um, your, and, and maybe I should emphasize that you're doing this with perennial plants. Um, so you've got your stubble, but then you also have new green growth, as you can see in this photo that eventually grows up and just covers up that stubble. And those stems will naturally break down with time. Um, we do have a bookmark to, to help you. Rachel will put it in the chat for you, but it kind of helped guide you through that step-by-step -step process. This was created in collaboration with the University of Minnesota. Um, and I think it's a really, fun resource to help you make sense of this and give it away at events if you want to. Um, uh, there's often questions about what plants are best for stem nesting bees. Certainly they're not all created equal or not all used equally. In my own landscape, almost every stem I cut of Monarda gets used and same with Agastache, both in the, in the mint family. Um, but yeah, lots of different wildflowers are used and also on the shrub side of things, um, sumac, very, very commonly nested in, um, even box elder, um, elderberry, raspberry canes. Start watching and you know, you'll know you start to notice some of these trends. Um, on this shrub side of things, what we recommend is that you prune branches and canes to provide the cut ends to promote nesting. So we're sort of simulating deer brows when we do this, um, cut at least four to six inches from the node and People have a lot of questions about which part of the plant is important. So you're making a cut and you've got this part that you're taking off the plant and you've got the part that's remaining. In our experience, the part that's remaining, so the stubble or the branches attached to the shrub, that's what's really being used. The part that you take off, um, you can pile it up in these piles, leave it on site if you want. Um, it doesn't seem to be as important for the stem nesters, but a lot of other wildlife, including bumblebees, might use that site. Okay, leave your logs and celebrate your snags. Lots of creative ways to do this. Um, and this next slide shows how dead wood is really important at all stages of decay. Um, there are a number of, of bees that are typically thought of as ground nesting bees. Their, their relatives are mostly ground nesting, but they have evolved to nest in really well decomposed wood that's almost turning to soil. Um, these are two logs showing the uh, nest of Agocoropira, a pretty green sweat bee. And um, this has also been well documented in Lazia glossum, another kind of typically ground nesting sweat bee. 
Um, there were some questions coming in about what do leaf cutter bees use for, for um, partitioning their cells? Here are just a few commonly used genera nationwide. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these, but you can take a screenshot if you want to or come back to it. I, I haven't talked about the fact yet that they also can use petals of some flowers, which is a really beautiful thing to see. And one more point here is just feel free to contribute your sightings. There's an iNaturalist page specifically dedicated to Mega Kylie leaf cuts. Um, and this is incredibly useful in helping us better understand what they're using nationwide. I'll turn it back to me. It's back to me. Um, so I'm gonna talk about what you can do to improve habitat for the soil nesters, as well as the cavity nesters. And some of the advice is quite similar. For example, these, this, this brush pile on the left side of of uh, the slide um, is a great piece of habitat for, um, for ground nesting bees of various sorts, in part because that chipmunk in the center of the photo is going to dig its, its burrow under uh, this piece of, of cover. And the next year we might see just the right cavity for a bumblebee. In fact, the number one rodent for excavating the tunnels for the rusty patch bumblebee, the endangered species that occurs in the Midwest is chipmunks. So, um, so brush piles like this, attract other wildlife um, and they themselves are good are good um, habitat for bees. Uh, a rock pile is, is kind of a similar thing. We get all kinds of, of other organisms and plants using the, the area around the rocks. And we tend to find that bumblebees and other uh, soil nesting bees will use the ground underneath these rocks uh, because they're, they have this natural cover. Um, we encourage people to add dimension and diversity to their yards. So I'm sure you've heard some about this, about planting native plants in your yard as opposed to a green grass lawn. And here we see on the left, uh, a sort of standard lawn that you're gonna mow every 10 days or something. Um, and then on the right, a different house where someone has ripped out the lawn and planted a bunch of uh, flowering stuff that's native in their area. And the main reason that people tend to do this is to provide floral resources for bees and other pollinators. But we want you to understand that, um, that this also creates lots of nesting opportunities for bees. For example, Sarah has been talking about this, those stems. And in that photo, you can see some of those, those very plants that, um, that create those stems for next year. Uh, there's, there's bare soil under, uh, under the plants, under the canopies here that bees are using for excavating their, their um, subterranean nests. And there may be cavities created by other wildlife that we allow into our gardens of this sort, but that we might not tolerate in a green grass lawn. So think about ways that you can change um, the physical structure of the land that you manage. This may require you to change your ideas about aesthetics, right? Like what's, what's tidy, what's neat, what's attractive or beautiful. And we are not going to get into telling you what you should think is, is attractive in your front lawn, front yard, but, um, but we do think that there is a little bit of a, uh, a shift people have to make to understand this, this much more messy and chaotic front yard as a thing of beauty, um, um, just like the green yard is, is also a velvety thing of beauty to me. Um, so speaking of lawn, um, we can also just reduce our use of lawn a little bit. It's not an all or nothing proposition. Here's a nice example where uh, native plant gardening has largely taken over from the lawn, but the, there are still paths and um, little accents uh, of grassy areas for pets and children and the rest of us. Um, and that's a nice thing you can do. And I'll say that um, the edge between the, the, the green grass lawn and the other vegetation is often a very important place for nesting. You, you get bare soil, you get a change in elevation of a, of a centimeter or two or three. Um, and we do find bees making use of that little, that little uh, dividing line between um, a field, let's say, and a, a mowed area. Um, we encourage you to leave the leaves. Uh, so if you live in a place with deciduous trees um, and the leaves fall in the fall, um, we, we tend to want to sweep those up and get rid of them and tidy our yards. But leaving the leaves on the ground until it, um, the following spring can provide uh, overwintering habitat for many insects, we think it probably also uh, encourages bees to nest underground in these places because it provides some cover for the ground. It limits the amount of uh, loss of moisture from the soil each day. Um, so you can, you might want to move your leaves to a certain part of the yard. One idea would be to pile them around ornamental trees. Um, so not completely removing them from the yard, but just uh, siting them in one area. 
right? Um, shredding leaves is a great idea when you want to make compost and return the, the nutrients to the soil. Um, but we find that, that not shredding the leaves actually creates more structure and thus more habitat for these um, soil nesting animals. And finally, um, we think it's important that you spread the word about this. If you're creating habitat for bees, um, your neighbors may not know what you're up to, and they may be very interested in it. So um, it's been our experience, the, the, the two of us, uh, over and over when we talk to people um, uh, about what we're doing in our own native plant gardens, um, people get excited and they might wanna try it themselves. And so part of bee conservation is doing and another part of bee conservation is telling. So I would just encourage you to be vocal about what you're doing. Maybe put a sign up. Um, Xerxes has signs like this. Um, and let your neighbors know that you're, you're creating wildlife habitat in addition to creating beauty in your front yard. So uh, we wanted to just um, highlight a, a, an array of other resources that you might think about. Um, we've already talked about the two on the left and you've seen links to those. The book in the middle is called The Bees in Your Backyard. It is a wonderful book full of photos. It's, it's scientifically rigorous and entirely approachable for anyone at any level of familiarity with bees. Tons of beautiful photos. And um, I open this book regularly, um, even though this is what I do for work. Uh, Xerxes has this book, Attracting Native Pollinators, that you can find on our website. Um, and then here's a, a bees and identification and native plant foraging guide. Uh, by uh, a friend of ours called Heather Holm, um, and you can find that online. Um, and with that, we'd like to show you this very small font acknowledgement slide to just thank our many funders. And here we'll stop and say um, thank you for your attention, and um, we'd be happy to take questions as long as there's time. Yeah, I think we'll probably go a few minutes over. We have a lot of questions, and they're really good questions, so we'll just kick it off and get going. Thank you both so much for that engaging presentation. I can't get over the fact that they're fairy bees. <laughs> I did not know that. And it's just making my heart so happy today. All right. Quite a few people are asking about bark mulch and how that may impact nest ground nesting bees. Sarah, do you want to take that one? Sure. I, I have definitely seen um, situations where bees are able to get through mulch in order to make a nest. Um, Nests and mulch are certainly less visible to us, so maybe that's part of part of the issue. Um, but I also think it's probably a little bit challenging for them to navigate mulch. And I guess my biggest concern with mulch is that um, a lot of mulch comes from really questionable sources. Um, some of it's dyed and treated with chemicals. Some of it has, um, you know, can't be used. It's been rejected for all of other purposes because it's so toxic in one way or another, um, yet it gets chipped up for mulch and then spread in our yards and going into our soil. So I don't have evidence that, you know, those chemicals are problematic to bees, but my, you know, common sense tells me to use caution with mulch. Another thing with mulch and native landscaping is that Mulch is breaking down and providing a lot of nutrients that can leach into the soil and promote actually weeds rather than our native plants, which often tolerate um, low nutrient soils, um, at least in, in my situations here in the upper Midwest. Thank you, Sarah. So I would prefer to avoid, avoid wood chip mulch when possible and maybe use leaf litter um, if something is needed for weed control. Okay, great, thank you. So here's another question for you, Sarah. Barbara is wondering, are there any particular stems that bees like to use and will they use stems from non-native plants? Yes, they will. Um, one that I can think of off the top of my head is hydrangea. Um, gets, uh, people frequently manage hydrangea by cutting, creating stubble. Um, that's what's recommended for hydrangea if you talk to ornamentalists. and um, I've seen serotina nesting in hydrangea, which is not native here. Um, as far as what I found them to prefer, um, I, I mentioned earlier plants in the mint family. So Monarda, bee balm, um, anise hyssop, agastache, the solidago, um, so the goldenrods, which occur nationwide, liatris, blazing star is another one. Um, in general, you need a stem that has a thick enough outside to be substantial, doesn't break down really readily, like milkweed breaks down pretty readily, it's a softer stem. Um, and then some of the bees require a hollow stem, they can't dig out their own space. Some of them 
require a pithy stem and they actually prefer to dig out their own space because they want that pithy material to make their walls. So it really varies. Um, but I, I again, I would encourage you to just start cutting and then watching. Thank you. So I'm not sure who would best answer this question, but Amy's wondering how far leaf cutter bees travel from their leaf source to where they generally construct their nest. They have a Western red bud that they know the leaf cutter loves, but they can't find her nest. Uh, I'll, I'll answer this one. Um, so great question. And the short answer is that we don't know for most species how far they fly. Uh, but there is some research on this. And generally speaking, uh, bee flight distances away from and back toward their nest uh, scale linearly with body size. So the larger the bee is, the farther she can fly. Um, that's just a general, a general rule. Um, and so um, surprisingly, some of these smaller bees, let's say the Hoplitis or Heriades you heard about, they may only fly a few hundred meters in their entire life. Um, they, they just don't go very far. So um, so if you encounter one at your house, your property may be the, the sum total uh, of land that this, this animal experiences. Um, a, a larger body megachylid will fly farther than that. Maybe it has the neighborhood or your street. Um, I'm just sort of making this up, but we don't actually know. But um, uh, bumblebees can fly up to about 10 kilometers. So that's, that's as far as bees maybe can go. Honeybees about the same. These smaller guys, it's much more local. And on a related note, I didn't talk about this earlier, but there's some bees like in the, the Osmia where we have evidence that it can take, it takes a lot of time to provision a single cell. It can take all day to get enough pollen to provision a cell and that can require like roughly a thousand trips to flowers. Um, and it also takes several trips to get enough mud to build a cell wall, which I think speaks to the importance for us in trying to place our nesting habitat in close proximity to our foraging habitat to help cut down on that time and energy that has to be spent, you know, going from one to the other. Thank you. It's a lot of work. <laughs> All right. This is one question I've actually had a few people ask me in the past. Um, Amy is wondering, first of all, can nesting bees nest in clay soil? And then in addition to that, how did the nest not flood during winter rain? Any ground nests, that is. Yeah, uh, so there are, uh, there are bees that do nest in clay soils. I would say it depends on the bee. We see bees that really like sandy soil, compact sand. A good example is Calides, uh, um, the plasterer bees. And that's the image we used uh, for the, the, the outline slide, the little bee poking her head out of the nest. Um, those, those guys really like sand. But there are other bees that use clay soil. And I, I mentioned that for the Anthophora digger bees, they'll use clays and muds more. Um, so I would say yes, any, just about any soil texture that could hold together is probably used by some bee, one bee or another. Um, and then you asked about water and, and waterproofing. And so um, some of this, I have wondered the same thing and I don't really know the answer. I think in some cases the bees are blocked, are, are the adults are in the tunnels and their bodies are probably blocking some of the water coming in. Um, but more importantly, many of these bees, when they pupate, they create uh, a waterproof uh, cocoon around themselves, which keeps the rain out. Also, before that happens, when the mother is is creating the nests, in some species they will use uh, their mouth parts to paint the exterior of the the bedroom, the nest. Uh, cell with a waterproof material. And so even if water comes down to that level uh, of where the bee is, the, the bee, the, 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 the developing pupa itself will not get wet. Very interesting. Thank you. So Leaf, here's another question for you. Someone is asking, um, Fran wants to know, could you elaborate on your statement that honeybees are an invasive species for native bees, how much of a problem is this and what can be done about this? And I, I do wanna preface, we have a webinar coming up in November all about talking about honeybees. So if you want a very elaborate answer, we recommend coming to that, but Leaf, I'll hand it over to you to answer that. Yeah, I'm really glad you asked this question because I didn't have time um, to develop my remarks, my negative remarks about honeybees there. So honeybees are fantastic, very interesting animals. They're fantastically important pollinators in crop systems. But um, they're from the old world, so-called. They're from Eurasia and North Africa, also Sub-Saharan Africa. 
uh, and they were transported here by people um, as recently as the 1700s. So these bees have only been on this continent for several centuries. Sounds like a long time, longer than any of us will be around, but it's not that long in terms of evolutionary time scales. Honeybees are incredibly successful at, uh, at, 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 at moving into new areas of habitat and also living in a variety of different habitats. And they naturalize in many places, meaning they go wild and they live in nature without the, the aid of people. Um, the reason that this is a problem for other bees, for our native bees, is that honeybees are very successful at exploiting pollen and nectar resources on the landscape. Uh, one estimate is that a honeybee colony can harvest as much pollen as is needed to rear 100,000 of these solitary bee offspring. So that's a really big difference with one hive, right? Um, the other thing is that honeybees have diseases that uh, some of which we can manage for with chemicals in the hive and others we can't manage for. And so when you put honeybees on the land next to bumblebees, um, they share flowers. And before you know it, the bumblebees are sick with the honeybee viruses. And, um, and these viruses get into the environment and they don't, they don't go out. So um, it's a big conversation to have. You know, we need honeybees and honeybees are valuable in many ways, but um, please don't make the mistake of thinking that the way to help bees is to take up beekeeping. Beekeeping is wonderful, but if you get into beekeeping, do it for yourself because you're a honey eater and you're interested in these bees. Don't do it because you think that there's an environmental benefit. Um, in fact, this is an invasive species that we, we biologists see as, as problematic in many contexts. And so I'll just say again, my colleague Rich Hatfield is going to do our colleague Rich Hadfield will be doing a webinar on this subject in a, uh, later in the fall, and I really encourage you to show up for that. Thank you, Leif. Sarah, this next question is for you. How long do you recommend leaving the previous year's dead stocks before removing? Okay. Um, yes, I get this question a lot, and I would say in, you don't ever have to go back in and remove them. Um, they will break down with time and the timing of their breaking down is probably pretty closely synced to the timing of the bees emergence. So hopefully that makes sense. You're, you know, every year you'll be going in and cutting new stubble from the tall plants that have grown the previous year, but the old stubble just naturally disintegrates with time. Yep. So you might see it for, you know, if you cut it, in one spring, the next spring, you might see it, and that would be a good time to observe bees emerging out of it. Um, but after that, it, it'll break down. Another question for you, Sarah, as well. There's a few people just wondering in general about how the offspring get out of the stems, and if there's any truth um, to be said of whether females or males are at different points in the stem as well. Yeah. My understanding is that females are typically, at least in the osmia, laid in the in the back of the nest and males in the front. Um, and females may develop, any individual may develop at a given point in time and um, not, they can, they're able, this is amazing, but they're able to squeeze past their siblings and also chew their way through mud walls in order to get out. Um, and that's pretty important considering some of their siblings may have died in the nest and they can't just sit in there and wait forever. Um, so they do, they do move through. Great, thank you. And in the case of the ground nesting bees, Leaf, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding with a lot of the ground nesting bees is that they don't need to use the, the tunnel that their mother dug. They can actually just dig straight up and get out. I think that's true for some of them. I, I'm not really sure which, which ones do that versus following the tunnel, but you're right. The mom sometimes backfills quite a quite a distance away from the, the cell. So the, the bee, when it emerges, does have to dig at least until it gets to her, her main stem tunnel. Yeah, and we're getting some questions, related questions coming in from folks who are farming and wondering about the consequences of tillage on ground nests. Um, and I mean, one thing that is helpful is that, you know, even if the top part of the nest is destroyed, like I just mentioned, some of these bees can dig straight up and still get out of the soil successfully. Um, but another strategy that I'm using a lot with the farmers that I work with is to create some set aside areas on the farm that aren't exposed to tillage. So 
especially a lot of organic farmers are really relying on tillage for weed control. Um, so we'll, we'll plant native strips on the edges of fields or sometimes even on the interior of fields that are never tilled. And those are areas with native wildflowers that provide food and nest sites um, and ground nesting sites in really close proximity to the places on the farm where the farmer needs them. <laughs> you know, some of these some of these bees and also natural enemies for pest control have really short flight distance, like Leaf mentioned earlier. So getting that habitat in close proximity to your crops can be pretty awesome. Thank you for jumping in and answering that question. Another question for you, someone just conf is confirming, uh, Mindy's wondering, so she does not need to deadhead her plants. Okay, deadhead just means take the, is that you take the flower off to get it to flower again? I believe so. Um, yeah, I think that's more of a thing folks do with annual annual flowers like zinnias or things that you want, cosmos, things you want to keep blooming and blooming. Um, what we recommend with the native perennial flowers is that you, yes, you would not deadhead them. You would You would let them go all the way to flower and all the way to seed. Um, and then in the following spring, you would cut them back at heights of six to eight to 12, whatever inches. Someone also had a question coming in about um, she doesn't like, or this person doesn't like to let her natives set seed because apparently the, the areas, it's just getting too dense with, with native wildflowers. So um, there's this tendency to remove the seed heads to prevent them from setting seed. I think that's fine if you have to go in and you know, cut off some parts of your plant um, before you are at the point where you wanna create stem stubble, I think that's fine. I went through like many of you in the Midwest are probably familiar with bee balm getting a, a oh man, what is it? It's, almost, it's like a white mold um, on the foliage. It's not a mold, but it's something like that. Um, so I, I went in on mine and, and removed the plants, but I, I cut really high and I'll be able to go back in the spring and cut at appropriate heights for making stem stubble. Hey, Sarah, sorry to interrupt. There's a fire alarm, uh, where I'm presenting. So I'm going to have to say goodbye to everybody now and go outside. Okay. Thank you very Thank much you. Everybody for your attention. Bye. Thank you, Leaf. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> did you want to finish, Sarah? And then we'll try to get a couple question, more questions in before we end. Yeah, no, that was pretty much that was pretty much the answer to that question. Just if you have to, if you have to make two cuts, if you have to make a cut in the fall, you can. But I would encourage you to go back and make a, a second cut in the spring because that spring cut is going to be a nice, clean entrance that your bees can get in and nest more easily. Okay, great. So I appreciate this question because we have some folks on that may not be gardeners and may not have a yard. And so Sarah's wondering for people who live in apartments and don't have yards, would artificial nest box be better than nothing? If you're not able to do plants artificial, yes, I would say yes. And you'll know if you see occupation, you know, if you, if you see things moving in there. You'll just have this added responsibility of managing that nest um, for, you know, for san especially for sanitation. So you might have to use straws and remove them annually. And yeah, there's various resources and strategies to help you through that. Okay. Another question for you, Sandra, is wondering if the holes in Deadwood are made by bees. Mm, for the most part, no. I didn't talk about carpenter bees, the large carpenter bees, but they will chew holes in wood. Um, most of the bees that I talk about, I talked about today anyway, don't chew their own holes, but they will use the abandoned hole made by some other insect. And typically that insect is a beetle, um, some kind of, of, I was calling them boring beetles. Um, I mean, that's technically what they're called. They're beetles that bore through wood. Okay, thank you. So we have a couple of questions about fire, about burning um, brush piles and obviously avoiding, avoiding burning these as best without killing bees, but if they have to, is there a specific time of year that would be best like in the fall or winter in the late spring? Um, 
a good question. Um, I would say probably not fall or winter um, because that's when the majority of things are going to be overwintering. Spring, you'll be getting some bees. Some bees will be emerging and leaving the, that resource. Other bees will be looking for a new place to nest. So within days of emerging, a bee is looking for a place to nest. Um, so there's really no great time for a lot of our management activities, even like burning of a prairie, which is a really important thing to do to maintain the long-term diversity of the prairie, the plant community. Um, there's no real good time. Um, so what we recommend is doing whatever you're doing, doing it, um, just portions of, you know, I, sorry, I'm struggling for the word for this, but um, you know, only only burning a third of your prairie at a time and rotating that burn through your prairie. Or if you have to burn some brush, just set some aside if you can that you don't have to burn. So, you know, some individuals will have that that resource. All right, and we have time for probably a couple more, just one or two more questions. Um, can you recommend sizes to drill horizontally into dead upright stumps? Would you recommend that? And is it important of what direction you're drilling down and how deeply? Okay, for sizes. Yeah, I didn't talk about this, but that's another kind of compromise between the artificial nesting, the bee blocks, and just like totally letting nature do its thing um, and leaving dead wood around. Um, so the compromise would be taking a drill out to, you know, your, your dead wood, um, stumps, snags, whatever you might have, logs, and drilling into that wood to, to you're simulating those those beetle burrows I was just talking about. So you're creating these empty tunnels that that bees can move into. They really do use these tunnels, which tells us that's a limiting resource. Um, and as far as what size hole to make, I I would use a variety of drill size drill bit sizes um, because some of our bees are just tiny. Some of them are quite large. Um, and what was the other question? Don't drill all the way through. You know, you need a back end to the tunnel. Um, did that cover every part of that question? I'm not sure. I think they were asking about direction, like going straight in. Oh, or going well. yeah. So, well, south and southeast is a good direction to face just to increase the chances that the, the nest will warm up. Um, early and extend the period of activity for these bees. Um, as far as angle to drill, I've only, I would just do horizontal probably, um, but some bees do nest vertically. I really don't know. I really don't know. I mean, we found with the stem stubble that a vertical stem in the case of a stem, is, it seems to be more attractive than a horizontal stem, especially a horizontal stem laying on the ground um, because those stems on the ground are, are quite subject to rot. Um, so that might be part of it. That might be even more important than the angle. Um, but the tunnels in wood tend to at least start out horizontal and then they might curve a lot depending on what insect made that burrow. 